tried his sculpting process as freeing the angel from the marble. Okay, so I forgot that I mentioned Michelangelo and the angel. Mm -hmm. And when you were reading that, I thought, I'm going to mention Michelangelo and the angel. <laughs> Um, I think they're everywhere. I think uh, we talked about this, you and I, uh, about even aphorists stealing from themselves as playwrights. Oh, here's a good line. Here's something that on its own is a good sentence. Mm. Does it need the play or the essay or the rest of it? Emerson. Emerson is great that way. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's full of good lines. Um, and so, so yeah. So I think I think the aphorist has sort of this magpie mentality and eye, where they're always sort of looking for shiny things that that can stand alone by themselves. And sometimes you deliberately write aphorisms, and sometimes you don't. Sometimes it's in fact a, a longer piece, uh, an essay or such, mm -hmm. and you think, okay, you know what, this this can do this by itself can defend itself. Right. It can, it, it can stand alone. So you, do you discard the rest of the essay then? No, I keep, keep it. Them. No, yeah. I, I keep it. I, I don't want to waste any, anything <laughs> like that. Uh, but, but I do realize that that can have an independent life. Mm. Uh, so, so the essay might be about you know, the role of, of poets in times of political crises, for example. Mm. But then there's the aphorism that can go uh, on its own because it doesn't necessarily belong to that, mm. or it does, but not exclusively. So some of the aphorisms in that book, then, are, do they appear in your essays as well? Or uh, <laughs> rarely. Mm. But, but, but sometimes I think, yeah, no, I, you know, I, instead of quoting someone, I've said something. Yeah. My <laughs> work here. I'm, I'm guilty of that. Yeah. So be hunting for them now in the essays. Yeah, <laughs> no, I think, why not? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, the one of these is, aphorisms are the parents of essays and the children of poems. Mm. The parents of essays. <laughs> okay. And the children of poems. Okay. I don't remember that, but, <laughs> but, but that's the other thing also. I mean, it, uh, I don't remember that. Um, yeah. No, I think that's good. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, in the sense of, okay, let's go back to Nietzsche so I don't have to think about myself or worry about myself for too long. Um, he, he, Nietzsche speaks of, of aphorisms being able to be unpacked into uh, essays mm. or even books, yeah. and and he demonstrates how he can do how he can do this. So they are the say again, say again. The, the aphorisms are the parents of essays and the children of poems. Okay, so they're the parents of aphorisms. They can give uh, birth to aphorisms, uh, and the children of poems. Huh. Yeah, that too. Because maybe <laughs> poems are richer than that. A poem, a poem, uh, uh, aphorisms, uh, there's, I mean, Sontag, quite a very ambivalent, Susan Sontag, mm. uh, an American in the, in the Rothschild <laughs> Institute. I point to the flag over there, uh, who I'm greatly indebted to, and who also is deeply influenced by many of the people that I'm deeply influenced by. Uh, Wild and Nietzsche being two of them, uh, and then there's Sontag. But um, she sort of has a very problematic relationship with, with aphorisms mm. as being aristocratic thinking. They yeah. don't take time to explain themselves. They just sort of state something and then leave the room. Mm. That's why I like them. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 so there is that aspect of an aphorism sort of declaring a state or a realization. Nietzsche's line about uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, the, the shortest way between the mountains is, is the mountain peaks, and for that, one must have long legs. Mm -hmm. So you, we're talking about mountain peaks, and from there, you can survey the landscape, you can look down, but um, yeah, aphorisms are uh, not elaborations, whereas poems can, can take you to a place and be kinder and hold your hand and mm -hmm. give you a whole, space to imagine. Have you read Sontag's notebooks or diaries? I know that her son uh, has put out something yeah. very recently yeah. and I have read bits and pieces. I'm reluctant to have the myth exploded. <laughs> I, I know that it's, uh, it presents her, I know she's very hard on herself mm -hmm. and since 15 was, you know, um, reproaching herself and wearing the her hair shirt and 
uh, flagellating. Yeah. But I, I've, I've kept away from taking yeah. it in fully. I've done enough bits and pieces that I'm aware of it. Yeah, they're not necessarily that sort of personal. I mean, there's all of ideas in there. And I think it's okay. pretty, they're pretty aphoristic um, okay. as well. So it's interesting. I think the, the notebook is another place which kind of generates aphorisms. Mm -hmm. You're oh, yeah. yourself about how you have your notebook by the side of your. I think um, the yeah. notebooks. The notebooks is where is where uh, aphorisms are born. Mm. Um, it's a way of launching your diary into the world, yeah. which people, of course, do now all the time in social media. I mean, that's that's what social media is about. It's sort of sharing, oversharing, yeah. uh, if you will. But um, I remember, I remember reading again as a teenager. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe, and uh, who influenced uh, Baudelaire, who assumed Baudelaire had thought, for whatever reason, um, that he was the, <coughs> the sort of spiritually related to Edgar Allan Poe, which really mm. did a number on me because they look very similar. If you look at their photographs, is, is that, that it? Is yeah. that it? It really surprised me because I thought of at the time when when I first came across this, I thought of Edgar Allan Poe as a hack, mm. like I, sort of the journalism side. Oh, yeah. And, and I thought of Baudelaire as a tragic, romantic, great poet. Mm. And I thought, what on earth do you see? But again, the, uh, the American, which we must honor tonight, uh, I thought, what, what, why is he writing his mother, of all people, and saying, you know, this is my spiritual mentor, this is, my, this is where I come from. And, and, and uh, Poe had written that if any man, and by man he means human, if any human dared to lay his heart bare, he would produce of necessity a work of genius. Mm -hmm. And Baudelaire takes this up, this challenge, and he writes, um, and your French is better than mine, I think you had French, didn't you? Um, My heart laid bare and it's mon coeur, something I knew. Yeah. Yeah. And he, so Baudelaire actually writes, My heart laid bare, mm -hmm. and he lays it all out, you know, like kill the lights and just take it out and put it on the table. And, and, and if I fail, then, you know, then push me, take me to the task and push me to, to give you more. And, and the notion was that it's not Edgar Allan Poe who's a genius or Baudelaire, but the human soul. Well, the second part about aphorisms and the appearance of essays and the children of poems. Um, mm. the, the, the question of poetry, I was, I was very struck when I started reading this, that it kind of starts off with three aphorisms on poems, which yeah. seemed all to be in a collection of, um, of aphorisms. So just read those. A poem arrives like a hand in the dark. A poem should be flesh-warm, scented spirit. And poems are like bodies. A fraction of their power resides in their skin. The rest belongs to the spirit that swings through them. There's quite a lot in there, but yeah. Just... Until you pointed this out to me, broadly speaking, I wasn't aware that I began with that. But yeah. now that you say that, it, it makes sense because, because poetry, as I understand it, is not something that I can do uh, on command. Mm. I, maybe there are poets uh, who, who do, poets that I know and poets that you might know, who write, you know, poems for special occasions, or that's not something that I can do. I think that comes from from a space that, um, you know, the wood that finds the violin kind of space. Mm. Uh, so I think aphorisms are kind of a teaching over our head in that regard. Meaning, I, I look at even the first the first book that I that I put out as a nineteen whatever twenty one year old, and I think I'm not equal to half of this. I fail in this regard. I, I'm, I'm just not equal to it. I recognize my own shortcomings. So, um, poetry, poetry comes from that same space that is sort of uh, maybe there to heal, guide, instruct, but not. I don't think that all poets, if I can generalize, are equal to their poetry. Mm. At least, at least I'm not so as not to, to offend any other poets who might say, no, I am equal to my poetry. Yeah. Uh, no, I think, I think poetry is there to, to help, 
uh, and to help the poet first, and then whoever whoever else happens to to receive and, and hear it mm. in that regard. Yeah, I think it, it relates to the religious aspect as well, as which is important in the um, in the collection, and I know that's right from the from the dedication um, behind it. And there's a typo in the dedication that I realized oh, a so year, like almost a year later. Read the typo correctly then. <laughs> So this book is dedicated to all mystics, especially Sufis, whose art of living is a source of sustenance and inspiration on the page as well as off. Um, I don't know what your familiarity might be with Sufis, so I'll say very broadly speaking, it's the mystical branch of Islam. Um, uh, then there are Sufis who might question that uh, definition and say that Sufism pre-exists before Islam. It's, it's, it doesn't, it sort of um, took the husk of the faith, but it's, it, it's before that, which is very interesting for me uh, as someone who is not, I mean, I wasn't raised in any religious environment. We didn't, it was, it was a secular, crazy household. Um, we didn't pray, we didn't go to any kind of mosque or anything like that. Um, but then at some point I approached it from a, from a, again it was the poetry, it was the Persian poets who, who you, know, you know, the big, the big, the heavy hitters like Rumi and Hafiz and Attar and these people. And then at some point reading the poetry you realize there's more to it than poetry. There, there may be a um, some sort of anchor or home even there. But it's nothing that growing up I, I had any sense of whatsoever yeah. in Egypt. Yeah, I mean this it seems a bit of a shift from the, your previous collection of aphorisms to this one. There's much more of that, I felt, much more of that it, mystical. It, um, it, is, it is the kind of thing, I mean, I, I was <coughs> debating how even to address this if it comes up. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's almost the love that dare not speak its name. Mm. Uh, because I, I don't think that I'm qualified uh, to do it justice, but I think it's experiential, yeah. and it's, and I would go back to maybe make it less strange. I would go back to being a teenager who happened upon, uh, at the time it was Gobran, I was 15. Gobran is a, a Lebanese American, he's Lebanese. Poet, philosopher, mystic, aphorist. Aphorist, <laughs> yes, I, uh, unavoidably. Yeah. Uh, but but I, I come upon him at 15 because my father is Lebanese and he's an inescapable influence. And Gobran was steeped, but steeped in Nietzsche, Blake, and the Bible. I didn't know that because I didn't know Nietzsche, Blake, or the Bible at 15. Um, but it really, it really sort of tugged at me in a way that I, I don't quite have words for, but at my depths. My he was also influenced by Sufism, wasn't he? Um, I don't know that at the time, mm. but it wouldn't surprise yeah. me. Yeah, but it wouldn't course. surprise yeah. me. But, um, but, but Gobran was a Christian. Mm. He was a Christian. Yeah. He would dream of, you know, Christ's sandals and this kind of thing. And, I, and uh, as a kid, I didn't even know what to make of that, but I would read the letters and I would read, and, and I knew, you know, when I went to Lebanon eventually, you'd go, you know, you'd go to Gobran's tomb and there in Gobran's tomb he, he'd left something for all of us and he said, you know, I'm not buried here, I'm I'm alive, I'm everywhere, I look at the hills and I didn't even know, I was like, what did, on earth is he talking about? <laughs> you know, you are buried here. I'm looking at it. But but it but it said something. Mm. It said something at the time and I was you know, maybe it's a teenager thing, maybe it's growing up in Egypt uh, where there was a lot of um, religious hypocrisy and where, you know, I don't want to badmouth them too much, but maybe just a little. Um, so you, you'd, you'd get in a cab and, and he'd, they'd have the Quran, the holy book, uh, blaring. And at the same time, the same guy would be, you know, making a pass at some underage girl, and he'd try to rip me off. And I thought, wait, wait, how does that even compute? Yeah. 
Yeah. So my response as a teenager at the time, you know, enamored by Nietzsche and all the other um, naysayers, I was like, ah, you know, I want nothing to do with this. And I yeah. had nothing to do with it for a good decade or two. And then at some point mm -hmm. I kind of slipped in through the back door and I thought, maybe there's something here. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any aphorisms that you had in mind about mysticism or Sufism that you can remember that you wanted to talk about? Um, I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> you really have to kill the lights. <laughs> and everyone have to drink far more. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, one of the things that first struck me, uh, Rumi means a great deal to me. Mm -hmm. I know Rumi means a great deal to many people, but um, R Rumi sort of teased me into that because of his contradiction, because of the paradox, because of the fact that he could be, you know, utterly serious and profound, but at the same time perfectly playful and silly and contradictory. And again, I saw Nietzsche in that that's what I had approached initially. Um, something, something along the lines of, um, well, I'm actually wearing something. I should read that to you. That's easy enough. The wound is the place where the light entered you. That's Rumi. Uh, and, and there's an echo of that in Leonard Cohen. Does anyone here care for Leonard Cohen? Of course. He's nodding. <laughs> He's nodding. Of course. So, so Leonard Cohen has has a song where he says, there's a crack in everything. Mm -hmm. That's how the light gets in. Yeah. You had a song of aphorisms yourself on, on the wound, I think, in the I hope so. yeah. <laughs> I've, been, yeah. I've been meditating on it for a while. I actually had, I had a little film project that I worked on um, with a friend who was a filmmaker, and they asked me to do the script for a Sundance short film. And it was about what it means to be a global patriot, which is kind of a big breath. Like, we don't mm. want, who doesn't want to be a global patriot? Yeah. Maybe the people not here tonight. <laughs> you know, but, but the idea was very captivating. And I thought, OK, I can do this. And, and, and one of the ways I, I honed in on this, because it was at a time when everything was coming undone, and Syria, and the rest of it, mm. and refugees, and, and I thought wounds, Some, yeah. somehow wounds yeah. was a big one. And I was thinking of Warsan Shire, of where does it hurt? And she points on the map here, and here, mm. and here, and here, and here. Yeah. And this is you know, 219, the year of global protest and the year of global ache. And, and, and I thought at the time uh, of wounds, that's yeah. sort of as far as I can go without being too morbid about it. I thought if, if we can look, we, you and I and, and them, if we can look closely at our own wound, then we can sort of, through that peephole, mm -hmm. look at the world wound. Yeah. But you had to be in that sympathetic, uh, humble, empathetic space yeah. where you could imagine the wound of another. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, wounds. Yeah, yeah. yeah that absolutely <laughs> makes sense to me because it did actually seem to be a very political collection um, in some way. It seemed yeah. to be engaged with it's 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 inescapable. I mean, uh, if I were if I were to have my way, which I can't, living in this world, being also uh, Egyptian, uh, you know, uh, Muslim at the very least culturally, and living in America, mm. you have to address certain things. You yeah. have to say, no, this is not quite right. No, I think you you may have missed the point here. Or it's, yeah. But that may be an unfair generalization at the very mm. least. Um, but I don't. I don't identify. I mean, I, I don't identify as a as an overtly. No, yeah, absolutely not. No. But but I think there comes a time when it it would be lazy uh, not to at least you know mm. clear your throat and speak up a little bit. Yeah. 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 I mean, there were some kind of overtly political. Tell me. Um, tell me. Remind me. Yeah. Remind me of them. Um, that corrupt leadership creates terrorism and through terrorism seeks to justify its continued existence. That's, that's, I, that's <laughs> like head on. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you what I was thinking of when I wrote that. I was thinking of Egypt specifically. And, and, and I was thinking of post-revolution Egypt, uh, when we had sort of revolution fatigue, when we, we were 
were all idealistic and we were all in the streets and and all the classes you know because we have we were classist I don't know yeah how it is here but classist. You know, I, 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 not for me to say you say that as a Brit you say that but and I, I, I might have suspected that but um, but in Egypt certainly that's a thing mm -hmm. and all of a sudden because of the revolution you had everyone out there it didn't matter you know it, did, it just didn't matter because you cared about something larger than that nonsense. So you had the businessmen and the government types and all the pretentious, you know, the, the, the bullies and, and, and the farmers, and, and they all were rallying around the common cause. And so that was a big deal. And so in reference to this, um, it, was, it was the government in their devious way justifying their excessive oppression of the people, and there's variations of this theme everywhere, by basically saying, oh no, no, we need to do this in order for you to be safe. Well, because you were excessive and unfair, you were also cultivating these nasty weeds, let's call them. Yeah. So, so the yeah. two were feeding off of each other, sort of you had I mean, and you have this. Um, let me speak of America because I, yeah. I'm there. Yeah. Uh, you have, you, you know, it, the, 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 the hate feeds that. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you go out and you put out that hate, then you, then you encourage uh, people sort of to misbehave. And then you say, oh, no, no, that's, that's why I'm clamping down on you. Well, you know, if, if you didn't clamp down, if you, if you were sort of more open and mm -hmm. tolerant, then may not have such a, an unbecoming environment to deal with. But in Egypt, it was very much the case. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so that so was quite an overtly political one, but you were also yeah. mentioning the, the ones about wounds, which, which seems also to be speaking to that. And also, something else I thought was, was very political was an emphasis on forgiveness um, and justice um, mm. in the... In I was the thinking of my parents, by the way. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> But yes, that, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, but I think, I think you, I mean, it doesn't even matter what I was thinking of, because, because if, it, if art, and, and today we went to, uh, what's the name of the museum, Gerard? No, 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 really. Ashmolean. You can say it, too. Ashmolean. Yes. <laughs> um, if it matters, then time doesn't matter, mm. uh, and circumstances don't matter, because, because we're all here, and we're all living all over again mm. and dealing with the same business. So I may have been thinking about my folks, but uh, certainly anyone in an oppressed government situation um, would have to relinquish the need for justice yeah. because it's not happening mm. anytime soon. Which is not to say yeah. that you shouldn't fight and test the parameters of what is allowed um, but at some point, you're going to say, okay, maybe it's not going to be perfectly just. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in the interest of a better future, I will relinquish that yeah. and forgive and move on. Yeah, yeah a good one there was, to forgive is radical and visionary. It not only overlooks the past, but also sets aside the need for justice in the interests of a better future. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm still working on that one. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Have you got any further with it? Um, even when I read it, when I hear it now, the idea of doing away with justice rankles. Mm. Uh, but that's that's the mind, that's the petty self, um, that's the wounded boy yeah. uh, or citizen, mm. because I hope that it, it works on that level too. Um, and yeah, I, I think it doesn't, um, I think this notion of if, if you're going to sort of, okay, let's imagine, okay, 219, we're talking about sort of the year of protests and such, and I was even coming up here, I was sort of looking at all the different places that are up in arms mm -hmm. and saying, the government failed us, the economy failed us, this oppression is no longer acceptable, you know, we're going to speak up, even at the risk of, you fill in the blanks, mm -hmm. where I come from, they call it, disappeared, where someone disappears, yeah. you know. Uh, other places, they imprison you, you know. Jane Fonda and all these people were um, 
famously taken in for climate change protests and the rest of it. But, but, but I think the idea is, is at some point you sort of, you can't calculate the cost. You, 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 you do the thing because you realize that you're obligated because if you see, if you see um, an imbalance or um, injustice, and at some point you can speak up in some capacity, you kind of can't calculate. You have to throw yourself in, in the mix and say, okay, so, so, so this is what I have, and who cares if it's acknowledged in the way I wish for it to be acknowledged. Yeah. So, so it sounds like you've been reflecting quite directly on the role of art and literature um, in, in troubled times. Um, in, in these I countries. have, I have, and I, and I still till now, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm biased, I don't know if you have the same uh, disposition, but if I think of sort of, I think of Libya, for example, and I think of Khaled Natawa, who was a Libyan poet who wrote 42 years, if you haven't read it or heard him read it, I highly encourage you to do so because it says much more to me 